Hello, my friends. Welcome to Lindy's Magpie Reads. This is a place where I talk about books, and I have six great books to tell you about today, starting with Hair for Men by Michelle Winters. This just came out this year. Uh, Michelle Winters is a Canadian writer. She's from New Brunswick. She's also a painter and a translator. So th this story went in such a different direction from what I expected. Coming of age story about a young woman who had a difficult teenage relationship with her parents and with the world. Uh, she really got into uh, skater culture hated high school so much that she didn't finish. She became a hairdresser instead and ended up working at the most unusual hair place uh, for men. One of the things that really surprised me about this book is how it's about, um, how it looks at the necessity for men to have an outlet for being gentle, loving, being able to cry. Uh, yeah, <laughs> strange things. Um, the writing kept taking me in places I never thought that it would. And I love surprises like that. I'm going to read you a bit of her writing so you can get a feel for it. Louise is queer and has not had a, a relationship with uh, any significant person, but she does end up um, being a sort of a de facto parent. So that this section. Having always maintained a hands-off policy with kids, I was caught off guard by Rodney. As an only child of parents living a certain lifestyle, he'd learned to make his own fun in the company of drunken adults. But when we met and he looked up at me for the first time, his eight-year-old eyes filled with the hope that I might be different from other grown-ups, that I might be different enough to want to play. My heart clunked right out at his feet. It's not so long ago I remember wishing the same thing about my parents' friends. Surely one of you wants to color? People who spend time around kids must build up resistance, but I had no defenses at all. There we were in a secured compound bordered by water with no escape, and when Jenny would drop him by on summer days, he'd inevitably fall to my care such as it was. I'd wake up mornings to find him sitting in the pills cockpit drawing intricate puzzles filled with pictures for me to find. One time, when we were fishing off the dock, he turned to me and said I was like a brother, only better because I was a girl, but not really a girl. Being liked by him somehow outranked all grown-up approval. Yeah, uh, so that's Louise. Like a girl, but not a girl. Hair for men. And another Canadian author, Jessica Westhead, and this collection of short stories, Avalanche. I first read her collection and also Sharks some years ago, so I was very excited to see that she had another one. And this actually came out last year, but I missed its uh, launch, I guess, and very happy to get to it now. If you are a reader who loves voice, distinctive voice, Jessica Westhead is for you. Oh yeah. All of these stories are about white women who are um, somewhat belatedly realizing that Canada is a racist society. Uh, so figuring out um, what to do about it, uh, What how to act, how to behave, and sometimes failing spectacularly. So 
here's an example of voice. And this is a case where a mother is a little worried about her daughter and the male swim instructor. She's quite a little girl. She leaves Adelaide at school all day, but that's different because she has to. It helps that so far the teachers have all been women. And Stacy knows so many good men. They're all so good, loving and devoted and protective. And she can look at each one of them and know they are not the problem. They are actually the opposite of the problem. Although there are really only four of them, Stacy's dad and Christopher's dad, and two friends that either she or Christopher has known since childhood that she would leave her daughter alone with, ever. This makes her feel mean. Out of all these good men that Stacy knows, there are only four? Of course, she could probably leave Adelaide alone with 75% of them and nothing would ever happen. 90% even, or 80. Stacy feels like an asshole when she thinks these things, but she can't help it. In the title story, Avalanche, Tina is looking forward to attending the Women's March with her daughter. It'll be the first time for her daughter. Tina is pondering all of this as she rinses the dirty breakfast dishes. Then she puts them in the dishwasher and thinks, Ashley is an outdated name. This is a thought she has often, especially when she's alone in the house. Brian goes to work and Ashley goes to school and Tina stays home and cleans up after them, which is her job and she's glad to do it. But there's still a wave of discontent that builds because she has never stopped being upset with herself for not giving her daughter a better name. Something classic but unique. Ashley is the name from the 1990s, which was when Tina went to high school and the prettiest girl in her grade was named Ashley. Tina thought then, and continued to think even in her late 30s when she met Brian and was relieved to find he didn't have any baby names he was particularly attached to, that's what I'm going to call my daughter one day. And then they had Ashley, and now she's six, and the women's march is tomorrow, and Tina is wishing she'd chosen a bolder and more assertive name such as Artemis, or Zora, like the mums of a couple of girls in Ashley's grade one class did. I also flagged a passage in here that has a Tim Hortons reference, which is actually number 118 in my collection that I've been keeping on a blog online. Hair for Men has reference number 117. I will include a link to that collection down below if you are interested. Actually gives you a good flavor of uh, all kinds of Canadian writing. Next up is another Canadian writer, another queer Canadian writer, Jazz Papadopoulos. They're also a educator and video artist. And this is their debut poetry collection which I heard about on the channel uh, Sean Breeze Books. I will link his channel below. And these poems are uh, mostly about rape culture and uh, the complexities of living within a misogynistic society. Pretty hard hitting stuff. Very well done. I can't remember if I said the title. I feel that way too. If I missed it, there you go. Next is a digital graphic novel that I picked up especially so that I could participate in Victober. A Treasury of Victorian Murder by Rick Geary. He's an American cartoonist. Uh, this book was long time out of print. It first came out, I think, in about 1987, and there are subsequent volumes uh, since then. And what Rick Geary did was uh, found true accounts of 
unusual murder circumstances or unsolved Victorian murders and made these short comics about them. And there are three in this initial book. He's got a, a very distinctive, very rounded sort of style. It actually reminds me of comics from the 1970s and early 80s. People committing dastardly deeds, <laughs> but not enough that it would give me nightmares. And here's a lovely queer graphic novel from Jen Wang. It's called Ashes Cabin. Jen Wang is an American cartoonist based in Los Angeles. You might know Jen Wang for her book, The Prince and the Dressmaker, in which uh, the prince in question is a boy who likes to wear dresses. So a genderqueer story. This one is genderqueer as well. Uh, Ash is 16 years old, um, often being uh, dead named uh, in the text boxes in here. The dead name is blacked out completely. Uh, people forget their pronouns, the correct pronouns to use. Their best friend is their dog, Chase, and Ash feels like there's just no place for them in the world, no place where they can be themselves. And they decide to go searching for their late grandfather's cabin in the woods. And oh, you can see the lovely art in here. So it's a, like a bush survival story. And if you are interested in um, nature survival stories, you'll get that in here as well as a, a heartfelt story about um, searching for a place where you belong. Ah, so good. I loved it. It actually reminded me a lot of a book that I talked about on this channel back in August called The Gulf by Adam D'Souza. I'll link that video down below. And currently, The Gulf is shortlisted for a Governor General Award. So we'll see what happens. The announcement of the winner is going to be November 13th, so very soon. And the final book that I want to tell you about, I listened to in audio. It's Question 7 by Richard Flanagan, Australian author, and he reads the work himself. This is a um, sort of hybrid text. It's memoir, history, and also some fiction. Uh, he talks about his father, who was a prisoner of war, both in a camp in Burma, where he was working on uh, building a railway there, and also in another place, uh, a coal mine, or some kind of mine anyway. When he decided that he wanted to go to that mine, at the place where his father had been interred in Japan, uh, there was a museum there about the mine, and uh, a woman who worked at the museum asked him why he was there, and he said that his father had been forced labor, and she told him that, that did not happen. There, there were no forced laborers at this mine. So a lot of things have been forgotten uh, a lot of things are covered up, not just in Japan. This, this happens with historical truths around the world. And uh, one of the things that Flanagan talks about with his own family is that he learned from a cousin, or his dad's cousin, that I think it was their grandmother who was Aboriginal, although there's no documentation that proves that, but there's nothing to disprove it either. And he talks about the reasons why something like that would be covered up uh, within a family. Um, the shame surrounding it, the, the 
the pure necessity for survival in a racist society. And he talks a lot about uh, war, bombs. He writes, there was no straight line of history. There was only a circle. One of the uh, scientists that he talks about in this book is uh, somebody I hadn't heard of before, Leo uh, Schillard, who, who was one of the people who had the idea about using atomic energy. So he talks about how the public view of scientists has undergone a shift. Here's a bit from the book about Leo Schillard, who's believing that besides being cleverer than politicians, scientists had integrity and purity. And yet, because of their complicity with the bomb, scientists were now seen in the public's eye as hopelessly corrupted, more questionable than deranged generals, more dangerous than unprincipled politicians. This was Leo Schillard's unintended legacy. And, you know, there's more uh, in his book about mad scientists being portrayed in novels and so on. Well, there is just so much to think about in this book. And I really, really adored question seven. Highly recommend it. But that's all I've got for you today. I'm still working on uh, putting together a video about the second half of the Vancouver Writers' Festival. So um, watch for that. If you haven't seen the first part, uh, I will link it down below. I had such a great time in Vancouver last week and I have plenty to tell you about. So I hope you'll be back for more. In the meantime, happy reading, everybody. Do say hello in the comments down below, and I'll see you all soon. Bye. I'm going to read just a little bit from Empty Spaces by Jordan Abel. The windows shatter and the dead listen. The hills and the gloom and the burning metal and the bodies colliding and the ragged concrete towers and the blazing fire and the heavens and the light that cuts through the branches and the broken wood and the black smoke that drifts around us and the glimmering moonlight and the quiet uneasiness and the heaps of garbage and the impenetrable brightness and the stretches of asphalt and the trees swaying slowly and the multitude of shifting colors in the forest. Somewhere in the trees there is a spinning gear. Sometimes in the forest the skyscrapers are no great distance. Still the air sinks around the bodies with crumpled fingers and crooked teeth. The pathway splinters into the forest. For a few moments, there is shining glass and an ocean and wind rushing a hundred feet in the air. The narrow fissures, the pulsing neon, the cracked beams of wood, the broken concrete slabs, the burned bodies, the black chasms, the crumbling concrete, the cool spring rain, the breeze along the surface of the river, the city lights, the garbage in the ditches, thunder rumbles beyond the distant city, the ocean swells and sinks and crashes against the rooftops, the air rises and eyes reflect the hollow sky. Every few yards, bodies appear on the surface of the earth, are filled with light, and disappear. Thanks so much.
for watching.